Well, uh, it is a pleasure to introduce you to Mark Rachet, uh, who is a research di director at CNRS, uh, working at the Laboratory of Physics at the Le Condomar in Paris. Uh, he's uh, a well-known uh, research scientist in, in, uh, in the area of fluid dynamics and turbulence, publishing more than 160 papers. Uh, he also contributed to research in nonlinear physics, statistical physics, and numerical methods. And currently, he's uh, doing research also in uh, superfluids and, and quantum hydrodynamics. And I think this is going to be part of the topic of his uh, talk today. So um, um, we know him uh, from some visits that he made in person into Argentina many times. I, I know he also has contacts with the university in Chile. So, good. Mark, you can start whenever. You, and and the, the audience already knows how, how it works with the questions. Uh, you can put them in the chat and then we will allow you to, to ask them in person if you can. All right. Okay. Yes, of course. Thank you very much. So I'll start right away. So, um, okay, the, the talk I prepared, um, the first time I gave it uh, was supposed to be one hour, but I've been told it's better to keep it to 45 minutes. So what I'll do is, um, especially this subject, I'll just give the start, uh, the basic starting ideas and the results and uh, at the end so but the the main part i will treat fully so let me let me give an uh, outline of my talk so uh, i will start by giving a, a, a definition of what i call hydrodynamical systems using simple examples uh, like burgers Euler, compressible and incompressible and i need to do this introduction because i want also to talk about uh, superfluidity described by the gross pitayevsky equation, also called the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, and Madlung transformation. So that's why I'll take some time to do this introduction, and I will end it by simple examples, um, quantum shocks in the linear Schrodinger equation. So this is the, the, the gross pitayevsky equation, but without a nonlinear term, okay? Then I'll give definitions of the main uh, subject of my talk, which is the thermalization in a, in a truncated hydrodynamical system. So I'll give examples in burgers, and then I will show you what it gives in the full 3D uh, Euler equation. Okay? Then I will uh, talk about the same subject in superfluids. So in superfluids, we also have phase transition between the normal and the superfluid phase, and we'll see that this is described within the truncated um, gross pitayevsky equation uh, framework. Then I'll go to some recent papers I did, um, and uh, with Argentinian people, by, by the way, with Pablo Minini, uh, I, I will I will show you that in fact the gross pitayevsky equation that describes a superfluid can actually uh, do a very good job at mimicking a classical high Reynolds number turbulence and I will give a specific example for that on the uh, so-called ABC flow okay then um, I will finish this part uh, by showing you, I don't think I will have time to do it really in details, but I, I will show at least the beginning, the idea and the results, which is uh, how to estimate the effective viscosity in the truncated gross pitayevsky equation. So, uh, say what is viscosity in a superfluid? Well, it turns out that when you have the truncated gross pitayevsky equation, you have some thermalization and therefore some norm, normal fluid and this normal fluid has an effective viscosity. So this is a recent paper and I'll show you how one can estimate the effective viscosity. And then before reaching the conclusion, um, I will give you two 
examples of other things that can be done in the truncated um, uh, framework. First, a uh, problem of transitional dynamics in 2D earlier turbulence. Uh, with this has some relation with recent experiments by the four group at Ecole Normale. And then uh, I will briefly mention uh, what can be done with the energy spectrum in a forced Navier-Stokes turbulence, and then I will give my conclusions. So let me start right away uh, with the um, definition part. So the, the type of hydrodynamical systems I will consider in the talk are perfect fluid, superfluids, and then I will give a simple example using Berger equation in this case. So uh, what is a perfect fluid? Very quickly, I remind you that a perfect, uh, real classical fluids uh, have viscosity and uh, thermal conductivity. And perfect fluid is an idealization where you neglect the viscous and the heat viscosity and the heat conduction. Okay, so those perfect fluids have zero shear stresses, zero viscosity and zero heat conduction. And they turn out to be good approximation in some physical cases, like when you fly a subsonic uh, um, airliner, uh, well, you might know that the, um, most of the flow around the airliner can be described uh, as a solution of um, a compressible Euler equation. Um, okay, now, what is Euler equation? Well, I'll give um, a simple example, um, which is the barotropic case. Because in general, if you neglect viscosity and thermal conductivity, you still have the um, thermodynamical variables, and usually you have two of them, uh, let's say pressure and temperature. The so-called barotropic case is, uh, for instance, this happens if your fluid is isentropic, so uh, you lose one of the two um, thermodynamic variables because the entropy is constant, and then the density is just a function of pressure alone. So in this case, uh, here are the barotropic Euler equations. Okay, there are equations for the velocity V, the pressure P, the density rho. Uh, one is the equation for momentum uh, conservation, and the other equation is mass conservation. And because it's barotropic, we have this relation, the so-called equation of state, and this describes, among other things, acoustic propagations of sound waves with this velocity. And now, an important thing to remark is that the system is time reversible. That is, this whole system of equations in invariant, if I change t into minus t, v into minus v, rho into rho, and p into p, okay? So there are two well-known useful limits, the incompressible limits, where the density is constant and the divergence of the velocity is zero. In this limit, the velocity of sound goes to infinity. Uh, th so there is no equation of state, and p is determined by maintaining the incompressibility. There is another interesting limit, which is the rotational limit, in which we consider that the rotational of V is zero, the curl of V is zero, and so the velocity um, admits a velocity potential, and uh, the velocity of sound is given by that. And in this system, you have only compressible modes. Okay, now, there is, in general, um, variational approaches, that is to get the equation of motions from um, a variation, variation principle. I'm not uh, going to show you the thing in detail, which you can find in this reference. I'll just show you here how to deal with the compressibly rotational case. So, if you do that, if you introduce this action, this Lagrangian, so phi is the velocity potential, so you see this is rho phi t. This is gradient of phi is the velocity. So this is uh, the kinetic energy. And this is some function of rho. Well, it's very easy to check that the uh, Euler-Lagrange equation are given by that. And you see that uh, this is the mass conservation. And if you take the gradient of the last equation, you get the compressible Euler equation, okay? 
So I did that in order to contrast with uh, the superfluid case. So one should not confuse uh, superfluid and perfect fluid. The, the difference is that perfect fluids obey Euler equation and superfluids obey the gross pitayevsky equation, okay? And the quantum nature of the gross pitayevsky equation makes uh, some people, classical fluid dynamical type people are kind of disturbed by that and it makes it somewhat unpopular in these circles. On the other hand, uh, in the physics circles, it's very popular. So, the gross pitayevsky equation, it reads like this. Uh, is everybody still with me because I have no return at all? Uh, let me just take a look like that. Seems to be working. Yes? Hello? Am I alone or is the... Yes, Mark, everything is okay. Uh, everything is okay. Thank you. Yes, Thank yes. you. Just wanted to check. So, back to the thing. So, if you remind, remind you your, your quantum mechanic courses, the two first terms are just the Schrodinger equation uh, without a potential, and this is a nonlinear term, okay? Now, this is a key thing. It's the Madlung transformation, and it relates the wave function psi, so this is a complex field, to a density rho. M is the mass of the particles, H bar is the Planck constant, and phi is the velocity potential. So you see that uh, the velocity potential is related to the phase of uh, the wave function, and the density is related to the square of its modulus. So this describes a superfluid Bose-Einstein condensate at zero temperature. Uh, I've said all of that, and Okay, because there is a velocity potential, you would think it's irrotational, but in fact, we will see that later, there is a trick, it's not really irrotational, because uh, it contains so-called quantum vortices, which are just the zeros of the wave function. So, now I use my um, va va variational formulation. Well, to do the Schrodinger equation, it is uh, very easy to introduce this thing, okay? And if you integrate, if you do the variation with respect to psi uh, bar, you, you see integrating this term by part and just derivative this term, you, you see that you get uh, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. But on the other hand, if you do the Madlung transformation, and that's the use of a Lagrangian, is that as you well know, you can do the change of variable in the Lagrangian. So if you do this change of variable in this Lagrangian, you get this one, and you see that it looks very much like the Euler equation Lagrangian uh, uh, with a given value for G of rho, but it has an extra terms that depends on the gradient of the density. Okay, so uh, because of this, uh, one can see that uh, gross pitayevsky equation uh, describes um, irrotational fluid, so you can derive the equations, you get the same continuity equation. You get, again, uh, the gradient of this is, again, the um, Euler equation, so this is called the Bernoulli equation. So up to there, it's a perfectly classical Bernoulli equation plus an extra term that depends on the length scale. So now the fluid for a given density, it, is def it defines not only a speed of sound, but also an intrinsic length scale, which is called the coherence length. And uh, so this is an irritational fluid, except near the nodal line of psi, which are superfluid vortex with quantum of circulation, which is given by that, which is uh, also the value of this is h over m. If you, if you plug the value of c and psi into this, you get h over m, which is uh, the quantum of circulation. That is, if you go around the vortex, uh, the integral of the velocity uh, has this fixed value, okay? Um, now, it turns out I don't have time to do that really in detail, but it's done in detail in these old pap in these papers, is that uh, the gross pitayevsky equation conserves the total energy, and the energy can be decomposed into kinetic, internal, and quantum parts. The quantum part 
being the part that depends on the, um, the quantum part being the one that depends on the gradient of rho and the kinetic is just the usual kinetic and the internal is just uh, the energy you need to to do to compress the fluid and the sum of these energy is conserved now the nice way to write them like this is that because each of these energy is a quadratic thing you can get a relate using Parseval uh, relation you can get um, spectrum kinetic energy spectrum and internal energy spectrum, etc. And those are especially interesting if you want to do quantum turbulence because people doing classical turbulence, like Kolmogorov theory, they always talk about the kinetic energy spectrum, okay? So furthermore, this kinetic energy spectrum, it can be decomposed into incompressible and compressible kinetic energy spectrum, all right? So this being said, I know this was all very abstract, etc. I will give you simple examples. So the first example I give is 1D, very simple uh, example, the 1D Burgers equation and gross pitayevsky and, and Madlung transformation. So Euler equation, irrotational uh, with zero pressure, it's called the inviscid uh, Burgers equation. In this case, the gross pitayevsky equation reduces to the linear Schrodinger equation. Madlung transformation gives um, the inviscid Burger equation with an extra quantum pressure term. And uh, what, uh, what I will now show you is a, a simple computation relating to these cases. So you get some intuition. So here you have on the top left the equation. So this is the viscous Burgers equation. So it's a 1D equation. You see it's dTV plus grad V2 equal new Laplacian of V. I mean, Laplacian in 1D is just a second derivative. The initial data is a velocity potential, which is minus a cosine. So that the initial velocity, which you see here at T equals zero is a sine, okay? And here you see the evolution of the velocity as function of time. So you see that the sine gets deformed and it makes a shock that then decays. And this is the spectrum, the logarithm of the spectrum as a function of time. So uh, without viscosity, there would be a finite time singularity. So at early time, the spectrum goes up, but then it feels the viscosity and it has a nice exponential tail. And this is a spatial temporal space like that, time like that, uh, representation of the solution. So you see the shock being formed here and then decaying. And those uh, are the constant uh, phi uh, lines. Okay, let me go, now go to the linear gross pitayevsky equation. So it's just Schrodinger equation like this. I put an epsilon here. Uh, Madlung transformation looks like this. The equation of motions looks like this. So it's the inviscid uh, Burgers equation, remember, the viscous Burger equation was like this. So if I kill this term, this is the inviscid Burger's equation. So when I get there, I have the same inviscid Burger's equation, but then I have a term with derivative of density. Then I have the same um, the, the equation of conservation. And now I'll show you what happens with this initial data and this value of uh, epsilon uh, which is the term here. So now we we do have a density which we had not before, okay? Uh, the velocity is here. So you see that the early time velocity is just the same as the inviscid burgers. However, when there's supposed to be a shock, well, uh, now there is no viscosity. There is this, this dispersive term and here is the, the strange things that happens, okay? Uh, by the way, this is, uh, why don't you see it? Ah, this is the momentum uh, density times uh, velocity, okay? So in fact, what happens, this describes, if you want to have uh, something physical about that, suppose you have a Bose-Einstein condensate of particles that do not interact, like let's say dark matter, and then at t equals zero, you, you impose the sine x velocity. 
So the particles here move to the right, the particles there move to the left, and this is what happens to the density. So this is what is called the quantum fluid dynamics shock. And here is the spatiotemporal thing. So up to the shock, the thing is very similar to the viscous or inviscid case. But after the shock, we have a, an interesting uh, pattern here that can be described, by the way, for those of you who are interested, um, you can actually um, um, compute the green function and then uh, do some um, uh, steepest descent on uh, the green function around the shock and you get a description of uh, how the shock looks like in terms of something that, well, if you are interested, it's given there. It's, um, I, I would rather go on now and show you what happens um, in the in the thermalized case, thermalization case. So this is another another game now that we are starting. We are imposing a trun spectral truncation uh, to the inviscid equations. Okay. So when you impose spectral truncation, then uh, the original partial differential equation goes into uh, potentially a very large number of conservative time reversible ordinary differential equation. And the th when we talk about thermalization, we just talk about the standard uh, statistical physics uh, thermal equilibrium uh, for these ODEs. Uh, assuming ergodicity, then you can describe them in terms of microcanonical and canonical distribution. Uh, for a large number of ODEs. So, uh, uh, these classical truncated systems were first introduced in 52 uh, by T.D. Lee in hydrodynamics. So, this is the original paper. That's the T.D. Lee uh, of a weak interaction, by the way, but in 52, he did uh, a work on that. Okay. So, didn't I... I'm sorry, but I think I had the truncation examples before. So is it coming? I don't have it there. Okay. Ah, it's it's further on. Okay. All right. No problem. So the general definition is, well, I've said that already, that you just truncate. Uh, the new thing is that this truncated system contains dissipative or pseudo-dissipative uh, effects. And so has um, some kind of description of finite temperature effects. So this is a, a, a um, um, summary. You start with the PDE. You assume periodic ba ba boundary conditions. So you can do um, so you can do here a Fourier expansions. And here the non-linear term they generally give a convolution. And so uh, for periodic boundary condition you have an equation like this where the wave number, if you are in D dimension, it's there are integers, relative integers uh, to the dimension D. Now, the spectral Galerkin truncation is to say, okay, I will put a constraint on this equation. I will impose that everything is zero for uh, large wave numbers, for wave numbers be bigger than the truncation wave number. When I do this, of course, I get a finite dimensional system uh, because instead of having Z to the N, I have things in this uh, uh, D-dimensional sphere. Um, by the way, when you do a numerical simulation using pseudo-spectral methods, you always do that because when you do a pseudo-spectral method, you have a maximum resolution. So there is always this truncation wave number, but the trick is that, well, if the spectrum decays fast enough, this is a very good approximation of the untruncated system. So the original PD is well approximated by the truncated system, only as long as the per, uh, spectral convergence is unsure. That is, the dynamics is not influenced by the cutoff. However, even when the dynamics is influenced by the cutoff, these equations do inherit some of the conservation laws of the original PDEs, like energy conservation. And if uh, you now forget about spectral convergence and look at statistically stationary solutions, then you can find them from the associated Liouville equation, where E is the conserved quantity. 
And this type of solution are called absolute equilibria. Okay, now, uh, the general property of truncated system is that the system relaxes toward the thermodynamic equilibrium. Uh, partial thermalization occurs at small scale first because small scales are faster than large scales. And the thermalized mode generates an effective dissipation. So now I show you what happens for truncated burgers. So now this is again my burgers equation, but it is inviscid, same initial data. Okay. So originally, until the shock, the dynamics is the same as the one in viscous with the very small viscosity and in the Schrodinger case also. But at the shock, you see that there is something very strange that is happening. Uh, actually, there is a lot of noise that happens uh, here uh, at the opposite point from the shock. And if you look at the spectrum, you see that it is evolving slowly toward um, equipartition. I don't, which would be flat here. I don't have time to say more details about this, but there are um, the so-called tigers, which uh, were studied by uh, Frisch and other people. And uh, um, the, you can find them in, in references. There was a lot of literature recently on these uh, topics. So anyway, now I go to show you what happens in truncated uh, Euler equations. So I do the same trick as before, but in the special case where I have Euler equation. So this is Euler equation, and by the way, it can be written in Fourier space like this. Uh, with this is the so-called projector uh, on, um, on function of zero. Well, I, that's a technical trick. I don't have to get into it. So uh, when you do that, you can check explicitly that you have two quadratic conserved quantities in this problem that are still conserved in the truncated problem. One is the so-called helicity, uh, energy, sorry, uh, which is the integral of v square, and the other one is the helicity, the integral of the scalar product of the velocity with um, the rotational of the velocity. Okay. Uh, okay, helicity, by the way, there is an interesting story about that because it was discovered only in the 60s by Keith Moffat, uh, uh, some 200 years after the work of Euler on the equation. So, quadratic invariant that took a very long time to be discovered. Um, so, e the helicity spectrum, the energy and helicity spectrum can be decomposed like that. And both are exactly conserved by the truncation dynamics. So let me show you what happens. Um, well, first, that was a work by Krajnan in 73, is that you can compute the Gibbs distribution here. Because both the energy and the helicity are quadratic, the Gibbs distribution is a Gaussian. So you can compute everything by hand. And the energy spectrum looks like this. It's k squared at small k. And the helicity spectrum looks like this. It's k4 at small k. For the, k. for the case I will present now, the denominator here is negligible, so the both spectrum are k square and k4. So let me give you an example. This is from this paper, 2009, with um, Pablo and other people. Uh, so we start a so-called ABC flow, which is a um, um, Beltrami flow. Well, I don't have time to get into the details. This is a 512 cube resolution, and the initial data has only two wave numbers. So these are the spectrum in blue energy and in uh, red helicity. So first we have the partial differential regime where uh, the system is evolving. It's Euler system, and so it evolves generating small, small scales. But then the truncation effects uh, start to act, so we are not dealing with the partial differential anymore. When this happens, we see that there is a partial thermalization at small scales, you, uh, because the small scales are the faster evolving. You see that the energy has a k-square and the helicity has a k-4. And when we go on, we have a relaxation that will take a very long time. But if you imagine that you have infinite computer power and you can go on forever, this thing will finally decay to pure k square and k4. So let me show it to you again, the full thing. And this is typical from what you get 
uh, for a truncated system. That is, you reach finally thermal equilibrium, but you have to wait a long time because there is a transient where you have partial thermalizations. All right. So, this is what I said. Uh, and so, ah, yes, maybe you, you did not notice because I did not say, but at some point you see here, you have a spectrum that looks, it has a, something like a um, Kolmogor spectrum, decays like a Paolo, but then it decays faster. And we can explain this faster decay here by saying that these thermalized uh, modes, they act like a, a viscosity, they have an effect to induce an effective viscosity on these modes. So pumping the energy from these modes and putting the energy in the thermalized modes. Okay, that's what I said. All right. So now we go to more serious stuff and we try to see what happens uh, in the gross pitayevsky equation. So gross pitayevsky equation again. Now I have to truncate it. So I put a projection operator that is something that kills all the modes with the k larger than k max. This is heavy side function, so it's a zero um, and then one. So for all the k's larger than k max, the argument is negative, and this just kills the um, kills the modes. Okay. So what do I do to have um, uh, to truncate it? Well, uh, I put I kill here. And uh, I kill here also, okay? So, it turns out that this system will describe a Bose-Einstein condensate at finite temperature as a classical field model. So let me show you about that. Um, you have three conserved energy that survive the truncation. The energy here, I'm sorry about the notation, but here H is not the helicity is the Hamiltonian, so this is the energy, okay? Uh, the number of particles in the condensate and the total momentum of the condensate. And they are valid in the truncated system. Uh, it turns out that the people working in this area knew a long time ago, 2001, uh, that the, uh, that this system does thermalize and that there is a phase transition in the thermalized system where uh, the k equals zero mode, uh, the mass contained in the k equals zero mode vanishes at finite energy. Well, in fact, um, if you use the canonical in ensemble instead of the micro canonical, this is an you suppose they are equivalent. This is just the standard second order phase transition with a complex order parameter, lambda phi 4, uh, from the Nobel Prize of um, uh, Wilson in the 70s about second order phase transition. So let me let me be more complete about that. What is an absolute equilibrium for gross PTSD equation? Well, we have to put a Gibbs ensemble here. Uh, but note that this ensemble is no more a Gaussian ensemble because here the energy contains a quartic term. So it's no more Gaussian. So it's not easy to generate um, uh, distribution with this probability. And there is a trick, I just give it to you. Uh, I don't have time to go into detail, but you can integrate a statistical, um, um, uh, sorry, um, stochastic partial differential equation, uh, which is like that. So it has a white noise in the right-hand terms. And you can show uh, by uh, considering the Fokker-Planck equation associated to this uh, statistical equation that it does converge to this probability. So this is, uh, again, something technical, but very practical to generate absolute equilibria in this case. So I will just um, quickly finish the review on that by saying that it can be checked, for instance, on density histograms that provided that the cutoff wave number is large enough. Um, micro canonical and canonical thermalization give the same um, histograms. So you can compute the statistic from both of them. It's like a thermodynamic limit. And when you compute this thing, you do find the condensation transition. So this is as a function of temperature, 
the density in the K equals zero mode. So there is a finite temperature at which the density goes to zero, okay? And uh, it's the, the lambda transition of helium. As a matter of fact, people doing second order phase transition, they use just this model that they call complex lambda phi four in a three dimension with another parameter with two dimension. That's what they use to do renormalization group computation of the uh, of the anomalous exponents. So I don't have to, to go too much into that. Just say that uh, we also checked that uh, one can also recover the 2D equivalent, which is the Kosterlitz-Sarles BKT transition. So this is a link to a paper uh, where you recover using um, 2D gross pitayevsky equation the, this transition. Works fine. And let me show you now the partial thermalization. So here is what happens to the energy spectrum. So here I have the kinetic uh, total kinetic, incompressible kinetic, and compressible kinetic. So this is what happens to them. So first I have a phase where everything co converges. Then I have more and more thermalized modes. And finally, I get a K-square spectrum, which is the thermal equilibrium. So the th same things happen if you, you, I give it to you again. At some point, boom, you lose the incompressible kinetic energy. That means there are no more vortices. So if you look in physical space, uh, this is the Taylor Green vortex. So here I've shown the quantum vortices, that is the nodal line of Psi in red. And so first you have a regular evolution in which you have turbulence. And finally things get very complicated and the vortex line density decays. And if you wait a very long time, you, you get to be equilibrium, okay? I have one last thing to explain about this problem and uh, this last thing is um, what is a dispersive bottleneck so from what i've told you up to now you get these nice thermalization states but only uh, by modifying the system by imposing a sharp cutoff well it turns out that within the gross pitayevsky equation uh, you can have statistical mechanics even without the sharp cutoff. So what I will do now is I will show you thermalization starting from an initial data that is always the same, but varying xi max, k max, varying the truncation wave number. So everything is fixed, but I just vary the resolution. So here is what happens. First, the three resolution give the same result because everything is well resolved. Then a uh, partial thermalization starts because the lowest resolution run starts to feel the truncation. So it goes away from the other one, you see, and it thermalizes. But then the intermediate resolution run also here starts to lose resolution and thermalize. But the highest resolution run you see, it has this cutoff that is due to um, a bottleneck phenomenon. I don't have time to explain it, but it's uh, generated because of a dispersion. And because of this, spectral convergence is uh, still ensured. So you do have um, you do have a thermalization, but the cutoff is not playing a role. So um, same thing happens in two D. So these are various simulation in 2D where it's much easier to do the things with various parameters. And you have a bunch of things which have both a thermalized part and a perfectly regular part. So they don't feel the truncation, they just uh, have a bottleneck there that allows them to, um, to thermalize for the lower wave number. Uh, personally, to finish this part, I find that very exciting because this means that uh, this is really a PDE you are, you are studying because you have not imposed anything uh, because the cutoff is uh, not the thing that drives the system. But still, for the lower modes, you can use uh, some kind of statistical uh, mechanical arguments to uh, describe their behavior. So, now I will go in, um, in another mode because I'm supposed to finish in something like 5 uh, or 10 minutes.
So I will just quickly show you the beginning and end result of several recent papers. So first of all, um, this is something where we studied uh, the ABC flow and the aim of the paper is to show that gross pitayevsky equation reproduces uh, what is known for high uh, Reynolds number tablets, that is that in this system, ABC flow, you have a dual cascade of energy and helicity, and we show that um, the gross pitayevsky equation does a fine job to reproduce, um, to reproduce the um, Navier-Stokes uh, results, turbulent results. So, okay, now I will go quickly. This is the definition of the ABC flow, and there is a trick to prepare an initial data for gross pitayevsky that looks like this flow. Uh, when you do this trick, you finally get something like that. I don't know if your screen are good, you will see that there is a real uh, mess of um, many, many, many quantum vortices. This is a huge computation, 2048 uh, cube uh, resolution. Uh, but this, um, I don't know how to say this um, kind of uh, uh, cloth of uh, vortex, uh, does reproduce the large-scale ABC initial data. So when, when you integrate this forward in time, I show you here a global result. This is the time here on this axis. This is the helicity of the energy, okay? And uh, kinetic energy or total helicity. And uh, the blue line, is gross pitayevsky with uh, 2048 modes. The red dash is gross pitayevsky with 1024. And the green uh, line is Navier-Stokes. So what you do see is that qualitatively, it does reproduce very well the decay of, uh, ener uh, of kinetic energy and helicity. So you might wonder how can it decay in gross pitayevsky if the energy is conserved. Well, this is just one part of the energies, the kinetic energy, incompressible kinetic energy, and it decays because it is transferred to other parts of uh, the energy, uh, basically to sound waves. So let me show you quickly. Um, I don't have much time. So just to say that there is a well-known formula about this dual cascade in classical flows, which which tell you that you get um, you get these things um, energy flux and helicity flux and you have this form of the energy and helicity spectra and here you can do it it works very well let me go quickly the compensated helicity spectra are very good so this should be a horizontal line and it is close to a horizontal line and okay kelvin waves are playing a role because we are dealing with um, we are dealing with a system where there are many Kelvin waves. Let me just show you a picture so that you have an idea of what we are dealing with. So this is a part of the whole field, and you see that you have quant you have um, little tornadoes that are made outside uh, that are made from individual vortices, and they are within the, the created within the flow. Uh, okay, so. I have to go quickly, sorry. Uh, there is a link about uh, reconnection and because of reconnection, we can explain uh, how elicity is finally dissipated at small scales. And okay, and the, the polarization of vortex bubbles is also in accordance with what you would expect. And okay, I have now no time. Huh? I'm supposed to finish now. So let me in five minutes give you uh, the last results. First, from sorry, first from this paper here, we did estimate the viscosity in quantum turbulence. So how is this done? It's done through high resolution numerical simulation. Um, and um, you can we can study finite temperature effects. Okay. And using a spatial temporal spectrum, we can measure the mean free path of, um, of the waves, sound waves, which 
form the normal fluid. And using that, we can determine the effective viscosity. So let me just jump to the end. Uh, I don't have time to go into that. Uh, so these are typical, you see, it's very high resolution things. These are typical fields we have. And uh, so these things are to determine um, the mean free pass is related to this spectral broadening. Let me jump to the conclusion, which is here. So because we have the mean free pass, we have the effective viscosity of the normal fluid. And the conclusion is rather not nice because it's basically saying that the mean free pass is very large so that basically you will never have turbulence in the normal fluid. You can have turbulence in the superfluid, but you will never have turbulence in the normal fluid unless you get resolution that are like 10 times, linearly 10 times, so a thousand times in the computing power, uh, what we know how to do now. So this means that if you want to study two fluid turbulence, you have to turn to another model for the foreseeable future. So let me just quickly uh, mention uh, other things that can be done. I just have time to explain the subject and then jump to my conclusions. So in this study, we showed that in an experiment, uh, it's an experiment in a flat box with magnets and electrolyte, and uh, they have reversal of circulations. And we were able to get the same reversals using truncated um, 2D uh, earlier. So this means that you can describe uh, this complicated phase transition by a, a, a truncated earlier. I don't have time to give the talk. Uh, uh, okay, so another thing is that truncated earlier in certain cases can describe the large scale of 3D turbulence when it is a force at small scales. So, uh, okay, I don't have time. I just uh, tell you, for those who are interested, I will give the notes uh, somewhere and uh, you will be able to look at the original paper if you are interested. So I now jump to my conclusions. So the um, turbulence problem is uh, maybe uh, the main problem in a classical dynamics and perhaps as nobody uh, was able to really solve it starting from gross pitayevsky maybe it is um, simple to solve in the gross pitayevsky equation uh, framework than in the Navier-Stokes. The, the point is, I give you several points in favor of gross pitayevsky Point one, there is not the famous problem of uh, existence of solution. Uh, mathematically, the gross pitayevsky equation uh, can be shown to have very nice solutions, etc. Then, uh, second, uh, naturally in gross pitayevsky uh, the vorticity is in the form of interacting uh, isolated reconnecting vortex lines. So maybe if we could devise the statistical mechanics of these things, this would be uh, a nice way to attack turbulence. Uh, also, a finite temperature effect can be used by a truncated gross pitayevsky but the viscosity is too large. Uh, turbulence is a still an open problem. Uh, okay, yes. Um, so, yes, I, let me mention the last thing I didn't have much time to get into is that a truncated 2D Euler dynamics uh, can be used to describe the reversals in 2D confined turbulent flows. And it also appears to, to describe in 3D some of the regimes you can find in turbulence that is forced at small scales. So this is my conclusion. And hopefully everybody is still around. And I've not been talking in a vacuum. And maybe it's time for questions. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Yes, we are, we are here. Oof. <laughs> So, yes, it's, it's weird when you talk and you don't see It's a strange because you don't know, you know, if uh, someone would cut the, the cable, you would not know. Yes. Yeah. Well, from teaching some, some things. Um, well, I don't know if the audience have questions. As everybody knows, you can put them in the chat as well. 
if you are shy, but don't be shy. Oh, someone is writing something. So how do I see the chat? There is, on the left, there is a chat oh, yes. icon. Someone is writing, yes. Yes. I see. Okay. Ah. No. What, it, what it mean by quantum tornado? Well, you see, maybe here you can see um, you 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 have a texture here, and um, you can see that it is made of different lines. So each of these lines is actually uh, an individual vortex. So uh, uh, if you have only one straight vortex line, this is a solution, exact solution of gross -Pitayevsky. So every time you go around one of these lines, you get a circulation uh, because of the quantized quantum of circulation, the velocity, the integral of the velocity around the line is H over M, where M is the mass of the helium atom and H is Planck constant. Which, by the way, um, if you look at the dimensions of H over M, it's like uh, the mass cancels, it's like L2 T minus 1. So it is indeed a quantum, the integral of a velocity, a velocity time and length, or so the same dim dimension as a quantum, as a, how do you call that, um, kinematic viscosity, L2 T minus 1. So all the texture you see here, is uh, made of many lines and uh, in order to see if there are polarization or not we had to develop special algorithms but now if i go back to the thing i call the quantum tornado let me go back to it here you can see it here or maybe i have a nicer ah you can see it here is that it's, it, this is again made of many, many, many lines. And uh, if you look at these lines, they make an object that if you measure the polarization, you see that in this direction, they are more aligned than in this direction. So they do their best to mimic a fluid, which is a big vortex. So what in a classical fluid would be a tornado. So I called it a quantum tornado with, with a question mark, no? Because I wanted to say that it is a large scale classical object made of many, 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 many small scale quantum objects. So hopefully this uh, answers the question. No. So I have a question while people maybe thinking more. Um, you show something that is, was a little bit disturbing for me. When you show the, 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 those results in which you increase the resolution and, and you stop to see the, the, the equilibrium statistics uh, distribution, uh, and, and, and you blame the bottleneck effect. So what does this mean? It means that increasing the resolution is sort of worst, or something like that? Um, sorry, you ask if it means that, it, let me go back to the thing, it was this, right? You're, you're, um, you're talking about this, if I'm yes, correct. Yeah, yes, about it. Okay, so you are asking if increasing the resolution is doing what? Well, it, it looks like it is 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 uh, shallowing the effect of the thermalization of the term of the right distribution of of of, of the amplitudes in the modes. It's yes, like, it's, it's not obeying what you would expect from the equilibrium statistics analysis. And, and yes. So, so it's, it's, it's yes, because it, you see these things are not a, a stationary solution. If you look at them, they go on moving forward. So it's more like a front that is moving forward, if you see what I mean, than something that is fixed. I don't know if the, the thing, can you see that it moves forward? 
Yes, okay, oh, I see. So, so it is not a stationary solution. It's rather something evolving. Now, why do I call it bottleneck? Is that um, if you go back to the original uh, gross pitayevsky equation, uh, where was it? Uh, okay, here, you see that this term here, it has a, a higher power. Where, where can I put it here? It's better here. This term that does not exist in classical fluid mechanics, there is this length scale that comes, xi. So a classical perfect fluid does not have a characteristic length. It, it, it just, uh, it is invariant if you do a blow up. But this gross Pitayevsky fluid for a given density, it has a built-in characteristic length, which you can see, for instance, in the, um, in the dispersion relation, instead of being CK, it's a square root of uh, C square K square plus uh, there is a K4 term that puts some dispersion and that depends on this length scale. So all that to say that if we go back to this problem, which was where, uh, no, it's uh, uh, after that. Yes, here. If we go back to this problem here, uh, there is a special wave number where the character of the equation change. For wave numbers smaller than that, you can neglect dispersion. So it's like a normal fluid, a, a standard fluid. But for these higher wave numbers, there is a lot of dispersion, okay? So we think that what is happening is that uh, these uh, dispersive effects are slowing down the transfer of energy to the right. Oh, I see. You see? So, so that's why you get this thing. But we, we don't have a complete theory of that. It just, it's just, I can say, very robust, very easy to generate. And uh, there is, let me show you this one again. There is an interesting thing, which is in a standard, um, how is that called? Standard uh, wave turbulence theory, you, you can get a sort of fronts like that, that move at a certain speed, okay? You, you do get them, but uh, they move much faster than what we find here. So there is something, um, there is something strange that's going on and we don't know why, but the idea would be that to get a, a front that's moving forward in wave number space, you see, slowly so you you have a kind of self-similar solution with suitable rescaling but we have not made the theory so the only thing i can say is that it is very robust you get it in this simulation and uh, i think it's very interesting because you you can uh, you 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 have a non-linear system a complete uh, complex uh, partial differential equation, and you can apply statistical physics in some approximate sense for some modes. So I think it's uh, something that should be studied further. Yeah. It, that, that thing about the, the scale that appears in the, in the gross Pitayevsky equation reminds me of something that happens also in, in, in MHD when you introduce the whole effect or the two fluids. Is that right? So, it's Absolutely. Perfect. It could also happen in some other equation. We were thinking maybe in whole effect, in whole image, it could happen. Yeah, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Because yeah, the yeah, yeah. scale. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Good. Well, you have to show a lot of things at, at the end very quickly, so. All right. Uh, well, I did my best to stop after 45 minutes. I almost yes, managed yeah. to. <laughs> well, I don't know. Well, uh, people it may ask questions later if they can and and, and and they have your email i think yes absolutely if, i if can also are. send us uh, if someone wants references i can send them 
Okay. I didn't have time to mention it because I have some <laughs> extra transparencies. I think I showed too, too many already. But let me just mention it is that we can study with the same method self gravitating systems. That mm -hmm. is, you can add a gravitational interaction and you can describe such exotic objects as boson stars, which are um, a super fluid uh, gravitationally bo uh, bound condensate. So this can also be done and then the, the truncation can be also useful to study uh, finite temperature effects. I didn't mention it because I think that would have been really too much in one, uh, one hour. So. Well, thank you, Mark. I well, know you're welcome. Okay.